Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're continuing our Tall Tall Let's Talk lore series with episode 3 of Act 1, titled Growing Up. So previously, we spent most of our time exploring Tall Tall's birth and some of his nicknames, but we really haven't talked much about his family environment and the role his family would play on shaping him into the man that he would grow up to become. And at the time of Tall Tall's birth, the year 155, the most prominent figure in the Tall household would be Tall Tall's grandfather, Tall Teng, who was at the height of his power as a court eunuch. And Tall Teng wasn't just any court eunuch, he was one of the seven Zhong Chang Shi, who personally served the emperor. And in addition to this lofty position, he was also the Da Chang Qiu, which was the title for the head eunuch serving the empress since her palace is called Changqiu Gong. So Cao Teng essentially held the highest eunuch positions for both the emperor and the empress, which made him an extremely powerful man at court. And in addition to his two job titles, Cao Teng was also one of the few eunuchs ever to be given a second marquis title for his role in helping the emperor regain control of the courts from the rule of the late regent Liang Ji. So aside from being Zhong Chang Shi and Da Chang Qiu, Cao Teng was also Fei Ting Hou, and this is probably the most important title for the Cao clan, as titles like the Second Marquis can actually be passed on to your kids. So in essence, Fei Ting Hou is going to be Cao Song's ticket into government down the line. Now, while our impression of the Han Dynasty eunuchs have always been this caricature of greed, Cao Teng was not personally drawn to wealth. He did not exploit his position to enrich the Cao clan, but instead, Cao Teng's legacy to his clan would be a political network 30 years in the making, as Cao Teng was instrumental in recommending numerous talented candidates to positions within the imperial court. And even though you might view this as a different form of corruption, Cao Teng did this largely for the good of the country, as almost all the candidates that he would recommend were people of merits, and most importantly, many of these candidates came from the gentry class or scholar clans that vehemently opposed the eunuchs. Some of these clans would include the Yu and Bian clans of Chen Liu, the Yan and Zhang clans of Nanyang, and the Tang and Zhao clans of Yinchuan. And all of this brings up a very important conflict around this period, as the political battles between the scholars and the eunuchs were heating up after the eunuchs were elevated to positions of real political power following their role in aiding the emperor to regain control of the courts. Ultimately, this conflict would boil over in the first of two party incidents in 166, now this was probably not a great translation of Dang Gu Zhi Huan, but since there are no official translations, and this is what I called it in the fall of the Han Let's Talk lore series, for consistency's sake, we'll still call this the party incident. Some people have suggested that calling it the partisan incident might be a better translation, but regardless, this whole conflict boils down to scholars from the gentry class versus the eunuchs that were rising in power. While we are not going to be spending a lot of time on the details of this incident, as we have already done so in our Fall of the Han lore series, we do need to talk about what types of people generally held power during the Han dynasty, and how these individual partisan groups would influence Cao Cao. First off, clearly on the top, we have the emperor, who is the supreme ruler of the land, but since this land is massive, he needs the imperial court to help him administrate the land. But this level of delegation requires a level of trust, because the last thing you want is for your administrators to rebel against you. So to combat this, you have a system of checks and balances placed on regional officials. For example, the Han Dynasty has rules that divided the land into provinces, which are then subdivided into commanderies. The highest level official in a province is a prefect, who cannot be from the province and they managed all the administrators from each of the commandery below. And administrators do have the right to run small police forces to rule their land, 
but prefects are not allowed to hold any military power. Then on top of these levels of checks and balances in the political structure, there is the philosophical belief of the mandate of heaven, where only the emperor's bloodline is granted the right to rule from heavenly powers. And this belief is also the reason why most close relatives of the emperor ended up with very little power. Princes like Liu Chong were given prince domes over land such as the commandery of Chen, but prince dome only means you get to enjoy a portion of the tax income from the commandery. You did not actually rule over the commandery. There was still an administrator in Chen, and there was a prefect above him. And for these prince domes, the princes were not allowed to keep personal armies, although Liu Chong did have a thousand crossbowmen that he ended up using during the Yellow Turban Rebellion. But this group was not really an army, but more of a club of crossbow enthusiasts, as Liu Chong was personally fascinated by the mechanics of the crossbow, and even wrote a book on constructing and using crossbows. So this is why during periods of chaos like the reign of Dong Zhuo or Cao Cao, Many of the imperial bloodline did not come to help the puppet emperor, as they simply had no resources themselves, thanks to the rules set by the main branch of the imperial family. Obviously, there are some exceptions to the rules here, as they were definitely certain members of the Liu clan, whether it's Liu Biao, Liu Yao, Liu Dai, Liu Yu, that did get regular government jobs such as administrators or prefects. But these tended to be distant, distant relatives who did not have a prince dome title already and thus had to take regular jobs in the government. Now, did the emperor have no close allies? Of course not, as the first group or partisan that we're going to talk about are what's called Wai Qi, or basically the in-laws of the emperor. These could be members of the empress's family or even members of a popular concubine's family. During the Han, the custom usually dictated that the emperor married girls from poor backgrounds, or at the very least avoided girls from powerful gentry clans. This rule, like the one that weakened the power of the emperor's close relatives, were designed to help preserve the power of the emperor himself, as naturally in-laws of the emperor will gain a lot of power at court, so to prevent granting this power up to already powerful clans, the best option is to give them to people who had previously little power. This is why we end up with people like He Jin, who was a butcher and ended up rising to the position of Grand Commandant. Now, of course, there are some issues with Wai Qi. First, while most of them come from poor backgrounds, they don't stay poor once their sister or daughter becomes the empress. And from there, they quickly build up their political power that is often unmatched at court, especially once the empress gives birth to the heir. Beyond that, they are often unqualified for the positions granted to them due to their poor upbringing and lack of education. And if you combine that with the emperors dying young during the later periods of the Eastern Han Dynasty, what you ended up with is a string of in-laws who became these powerful regents. However, despite this drawback, emperors tend to trust their in-laws a lot more than some of the other partisan groups that we'll talk about next, simply because no matter how powerful a regent becomes, they tend to never usurp the throne because the child emperor is their nephew. So in essence, the amount of damage to the dynasty as a whole is usually capped with the in-laws, and most child emperors who end up growing up under a regent eventually overthrows their powerful uncles once they come of age. Then moving on to our second partisan group, we have the gentry class or the scholars. Now, when you hear scholars nowadays, you are thinking about professors and PhD students. But back in those days, scholars simply refer to the gentry class who are the ones with the money to educate their children. And being literate was good enough to be called a scholar. Now, of course, some of these scholars did take their education seriously and went on to achieve great literary success. But in general, this partisan group represented the top 1% of the population, 
and the origins of many of these gentry class actually come from ancient times, with some even tracing to bloodlines of kings of former kingdoms during the spring autumn period. So naturally, their relationship with the Empress clan will always be very conflicting. On one hand, the emperor definitely need these gentry class to help rule the land, but on the other hand, the gentry class as a whole is often too powerful to make the emperor feel comfortable. First off, they control most of the wealth of the nation, since wealth during this period is largely a reflection of land ownership, and most of these gentry class have privatized and own much of the land in their local regions. And on top of material wealth, they also control the culture of the nation by setting the education standards of the day. For example, the gentry class would support Confucianism. Therefore, the education and culture of the time would all be Confucianism. The custom and the rules of the court would even be set to Confucianism. And even if the emperor wanted to make a change by adding some elements of Taoism, for example, there would be swarms of scholars arguing against it, using history, tradition, and even the emperor's own dead ancestors as arguments against these changes. And while this all seems a bit silly, the control of education is significant, as it also indirectly controlled who gets to join the courts, as during the Han Dynasty, there was no merit-based advancement within the government, the Han relied heavily on a recommendation system to secure government jobs. Now, this is not as shady as you think, as recommendation processes were usually quite open and transparent. Typically, every month, in most major cities, there would be a public event called Yue Dan Ping, where people would present their essays or other scholarly works to be judged in order to secure a recommendation to the courts. And the judges for these events are often a very well-respected scholar who would not only judge your works, but also your character, as the Confucian philosophy shares a couple of similar ideas with Greek philosophy with the idea of the philosophical ruler, meaning if the person in power is righteous, honorable, filial, pious, and respectable, then their rule will be good. So if you wanted to work in government, you needed to be judged well at this event, which at the end of the day are still controlled by the gentry class themselves, since most of these well-respected scholars would come from the gentry class, and issues of nepotism was commonplace. Now here I use Xu Shao's image, because he was a very famous and a very respected judge of these events during this time period in Runan, and the likes of Yuan Shao. Liu Biao and Cao Tao all ended up receiving recommendations from him. So we'll definitely come back to him in our next episode when we explore the story of how Cao Tao entered politics and how he managed to secure his recommendations. Because at the end of the day, Cao Tao did not belong to the gentry class, as he is often associated with the third and final partisan group, the eunuchs. Now the eunuchs are the last group to rise to power, during the Han Dynasty. As for the majority of the Han Dynasty, they were simply castrated male servants serving the emperor. They were always close to the emperor, as many of them grew up together, so they were always influential. But they never held any real political power until Emperor Liu Zhi, who had this rough childhood as he was handpicked by a powerful regent to become the next emperor after the previous emperor had died without leaving behind an heir. Though in this case, he was not the nephew to the regent, but rather just a random kid from the imperial family with the right last name, handpicked to be this useless puppet. And for 13 long years, Liu Zhi was just an emperor by name. He had no support at court, as most of the scholars either sided with the regent or ended up suppressed by him. And the only group that he could turn to for help were his eunuchs, which included Cao Teng, now the story of this eventual power grab is actually quite interesting as most of the planning were done on the toilet as it was the only time the emperor could be alone with his eunuchs outside the earshots of the spies sent by the regent. But we're not going to go too deep into it here once again as it had been covered in our Fall of the Han lore series. So if you're interested, definitely go give that series a look. 
Now, regardless of the details of this power grab, in the year 159, or the year that Cao Teng would actually die of old age, Liu Zhi successfully overthrew the regent and regained power as a true emperor. And then from that point on, eunuchs, his most trusted allies, were now thrusted into the limelight as they were given real political powers and government positions. While on paper, the rise of the eunuch might seem harmless and possibly short-lived due to their inability to reproduce, what actually happened was that their relatives ended up reaping the benefits of their rise. And these benefits were not only corrupt dealings, but rather a direct challenge to the gentry class. Even though class mobilities definitely existed during this time, with the cases like He Jin rising to a grand commandant from being a simple butcher, but at least in that case, his sister was the empress. Now, you suddenly had all these poor farmers and debtors who had sold their sons to become eunuchs, all of a sudden become these powerful regional players in politics because the son that they have abandoned a long time ago now had the ear and trust of the emperor. And this is just a different dynamic because first off, eunuchs are servants. And secondly, and probably most importantly, is that castrated males were not really seen as a full person as it was against Confucian idea of filial piety because there are three things that a son can do to wrong the family. And the number one thing on that list is to not produce an heir. So many in the gentry class saw the rise of eunuchs as a front to their political rights, as well as a front to Confucian values. And starting in 159, the conflict started to simmer until it finally boiled over in two separate party incidents where in both instances, the emperor ended up siding with the eunuchs. And it was not until the bloodbath where Cao Tao and Yuan Shao would end up butchering all the court eunuchs, famously known as the Ten Eunuchs, or Shi Chang Shi, following He Jin's death, that this conflict would officially end. But this brings us back to a central issue here that we will continue to explore in our next episode. How did Cao Tao the grandson of a powerful eunuch and the son of a super corrupt government official, ended up siding with the gentry class. Now, this is definitely an issue that's going to haunt Cao Cao for his entire life. So we had to spend most of this episode setting this scene with a few hints of their interactions with Cao Cao. So hopefully y'all enjoy this episode and I'll see y'all next time. Bye!